religious pride to draw on a Saturday evening. Um, thanks to everyone who is uh, putting up with the uh, lack of access to a chair. Uh, it's uh, not necessarily the most comfortable way to attend an event, but um, we appreciate the, the patience and the physical uh, stamina. So there are some seats, or at, well, there's some spaces in the, on the concrete floor up in front here if you want to uh, dare any style for the next uh, hour and a half. Um, otherwise, there are some chairs, or excuse me, there are some tables in the in the um, corridor that may or may not have some empty spaces that you can lean against. And um, there's even some places uh, on these uh, cabinets toward the back that, that offer some leaning room, but they don't have the best view. Um, but yeah, so thanks again. I, I appreciate the uh, uh, putting up with uh, the lock of chairs, and uh, it's going to be worth it. It's going to be a good event. Um, so a few things. Uh, by way of just introduction to where you are, uh, I think some of you are here for the first time. Um, this is a space called Studio X New York. Um, it's an off-campus space run by the architecture department at Columbia, and uh, I'm co-director with Nicola, who you'll see walking around the camera. And um, we're basically a kind of an interface between the architecture department and the city at large, and um, we've been, uh, Nicola and I have been direct co-directors for about a year now. Um, really kind of looking at architecture in cities from a pretty broad perspective, so we've done everything from um, interviewing FBI special agents about bank crime, and bank robbery uh, to a biotechnologist talking about the future of food and that's it, and its impact on the infrastructure of the city. Um, so we try to maintain a pretty broad remit about what it means to discuss architecture and what it means to discuss cities. And uh, I think tonight's uh, talk will be a really great example of that. Um, so one quick thing before we get to Matt. Um, there's a flyer on the table in the front for a project called Venue. Um, it's, a, it's the red flyer up in the, um, in the middle of the table. So that's a project that Nikki and I are doing um, over the next 16 months. Uh, that we're pretty excited about. It's a, it's a co-sponsor between Studio X NYC and uh, the Nevada Museum of Art in Reno. And um, it's basically, it's a very kind of center for land use interpretation style uh, traveling interview uh, sort of pop-up event festival. And um, we're actually heading off on Tuesday to go to New Mexico for some pretty awesome uh, site tours and interviews there. So if you want to follow along with Venue and see what we're up to, um, we've got a website, but also the flyer that can send you to, to that website, to our Twitter feed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so then two other things um, in getting into to the conversation tonight. Um, uh, if, if you, uh, I'm assuming most of you know his work, it's, you, you have to be an enthusiast to show up on a, on a Saturday evening for this kind of talk. Um, but so Matt, Matthew Coolidge is uh, the director of the Center for Land Use Interpretation in uh, Culver City, California. Um, I've been a long time fan of, of the center. Uh, it's uh, effectively a kind of, um, what, a kind of uh, expeditionary research unit that looks at infrastructure, uh, that looks at the impact of uh, human activities on the landscape, and uh, that doesn't limit itself to looking at only places of aesthetic interest, so places of land art, for instance, um, but places that would be uh, very much overlooked by the tourist itinerary, so everything from gravel pits uh, to highway on and off ramps uh, to, as we'll see tonight, uh, chemical burial grounds and other uh, such uh, attractive sites in, in the Meadowlands outside of New York City. Um, the, the center itself is on uh, Venice Boulevard. Uh, Mickey and I used to live only a few blocks away from it, and it's definitely worth a trip if you're ever out in Los Angeles. Uh, it's a small gallery space that always has pretty interesting work. Up. Um, two, two things I've already seen this year were a look at uh, the history of surveying and the uh, location of sort of baseline grids for the um, surveying of the, of the United States throughout history, uh, which closed a few months ago, and um, a piece or a, a show which I think is still up or maybe just came down, which is about uh, uranium disposal cells, um, which is pretty pretty awesome and, and definitely worth worth checking out. Um, so it's quite an introduction here, so I'll, 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 I'll hurry up a little. So also then, there's a great book that Matt did with uh, Metropolis Books, and they've got a flyer on the back table. Uh, anyone here picks up a flyer, you, and you can use a special code to get, what is it, 10% off? 25% uh, off of the book. Uh, it's worth picking up. So um, grab that flyer in the back. And then finally, the reason why we're all here is to learn about the Meadowlands. And uh, as of a few hours ago, hot off the presses is the Center for Land Use Interpretation map, uh, which is a guide to the Meadowlands, and that's available on the back table as well. Uh, so pick up a copy of that and uh, follow along. And uh, with no further ado, I'm going to throw it over to Matt Coolidge. Thanks. Thank you all for coming out to, uh, I didn't know the Meadowlands had so many fans. Uh, but uh, I appreciate it. And um, I, Thanks for the introduction, Jeff. Uh, it saves me from having to introduce the center. I'll probably not say too much about what the organization does. It's probably clear uh, from what Jeff said and uh, from our website and on. You're welcome to take a look at that. But uh, 
and I apologize if we're out of maps. Uh, I brought as many as I could carry in my map bag from Newark. Uh, they are available uh, at the Vince Lombardi service area on the turnpike. But yeah, the Middlelands is a place, obviously, that a lot of people are interested in. In a way, it is the away space, the first landscape for Manhattan. It's the first landscape where you can look across land outside the city. Uh, so I think a lot of the sort of cultural activity in the city, when it looks for landscape, that's one of the places that it sort of stands out. And it's a place that's overlooked, meaning you overlook it, uh, you look it over, but you also overlook it in a way. You drive around the turnpike and you see it and kind of gaze off. And it's a very kind of romantic space, I think, as a place that people project ideas about landscape onto it. Uh, the, the intensity of the urbanity meets this sort of intensely empty space with such a collision that uh, things are bound to happen there, both phenomenologically and physically. Uh, so that's where we'll go right now. Uh, and uh, so bear with me while I start this talk. Which is more of a kind of a, I usually do things kind of off the cuff, and this is partially off the cuff, but also uh, it's, it's a little bit more of a, of a personal, I suppose, kind of iteration on the space. Uh, the, the map is this, the product that our organization put together, and we have a thing on the web and a searchable map on the internet as well. Uh, but this presentation is something that I put together that sort of talks about the Meadowlands um, from my point of view as well as the institutional point of view, I guess. Um, and so I called it this uh, American Dream because because uh, because of this idea of a reverie that occurs out there, as well as you know from a commercial point of view, that giant mega complex out there, which is sort of happening, I guess now called American Dreams Meadowlands. Uh, the, you know the Meadowlands. It's uh, true north is. Uh, kind of diagonal there, but you get the sense of, of a zone that's um, a, you know, where you draw a line around the Meadowlands is sort of subjective because a lot of that area was swamp all the way down to New York Airport and all the way up past Teterboro, but what the Meadowlands District Commission calls Meadowlands is roughly this kind of 30 point seven mile or so box, so we include the South Kearney Peninsula in that. Um, and it's roughly as big as Manhattan, it's almost the same square mileage, so it makes it a nice kind of literal antipode. Uh, there are some points. Uh, but for most people, the Meadowlands is, is an idea of elsewhere. <laughs> sort of famous clients west across America. That's in the river school postmodern version. Uh, but elsewhere is a place. And here's the antipodal view of Manhattan from the Midlands, uh, uh, from the top of uh, Landfill 1E, uh, looking eastward. The core of the Midlands is the Hackensack River, which is a twisted liquid spine surrounded by wrinkled swamps, asphalt swaths, and conduits of conveyance persistent drainage network that underlies everything, back in Sector River and its tributaries. These tendons of infrastructure that kind of strung across the soft tissue of the marsh, converging and diverging over one another and on one another. People speed through seeing much, but missing more. The many architectural incidents the peaks of curiosity, the blatant wonders. <laughs> it's a landscape littered with office trailers, those sentinels and relics of transition. <laughs> Antennas rise above it, emanating, connecting the ground and the sky. The middle land has veneers of vistas buckling planes of pavement, under of suspension, 
The slopes along its western edge are full of graves and memorials. Otherwise, I would have destroyed your own. <laughs> Reflections back towards the city to the east, the place where the city's dead go. Otherwise, the topography is mountains of waste and flats full of lingering legacies. Constructed wildernesses mixed with a jungle of man-made monuments. It's a zone of fringes and transitions, a post-industrial wonderland for sure, full of visionary possibilities and harsh marsh realities. The meadowlands, though, are coming into view. Start with an overview, Newark Airport. You can land in the meadowlands from anywhere in the world. Getting in from the sky, the approach to Newark Airport provides an overview, like a map. Out the window, the sports arena is in a sea of asphalt. Route 3, the Turnpike, Hackensack River, Secaucus, Hudson River in the background. Sawmill Creek Marsh, a ghost of itself at high tide against the Laurel Hill all chewed up. New Jersey Turnpike's east and west spur conversion on the Belleville Turnpike at Langfill 1A. The turnpike in the rail yards at the south top of South Kearney. The turnpike crossing the Passaic River at point no point. The Pulaski Skyway draped over the land like a snake near the colorful waste incinerating power plant. The scrap yards of terminated material in Newark crossfade into the piling tide of containers from the port. Then as you descend into land, the spaghetti of transport and logistics around Elizabeth and Newark Airport. But after touching down, you're still not quite there. You end up first on a transitory medium, the air train. A link between the ground and the sky. It's an elevated monorail, like at the Getty Center or Disneyland. Futuristic, unpiloted, and automatic, it loops around and around. Like a flux, it does nothing but connect air terminals, rental cars, long-term parking lots, train stations. The elevated tracks of the air train provide a view that is between the ground and the sky, the roofscape above the landscape. It shows the eddies and backspaces of the airport and hints of the water that underlies the ground of this filled in former swamp, the swamp that is at the heart of the meadowlands. The pilotless air train reminds us that around here looking is not a passive act. Stay alert. Be aware, speak up, good advice in general. Thanks for the <laughs> The air train meets the carscape at a multitude of parking garages. Here, the locomotive transition can be made through the spiral innards, outwards, through the intestines of this massive conveyance engine, a multi-layered system of modes an urban digestive tract of arrival and departure. <laughs> <laughs> Until you're finally free and on the ground in a car heading to the turnpike and into the meadowlands. Interstate 95 goes from Florida to Maine. In New Jersey, it's called the New Jersey Turnpike. It's the central artery of the meadowlands. The turnpike travels the length of the Meadowlands and provides elevated views throughout. Even better, the turnpike splits in two in the Meadowlands. One route stays on the western edge and another goes up the eastern side and they both reconnect at the other end. So it's possible to go around and around in the Meadowlands. In a giant loop, a racetrack. Consider the first toll booth as a starting gate, perhaps. 
It passes many landmarks that will become familiar once we descend to ground level. Plasky Skyway, the end of the industrial age viaduct that soars over the meadowlands. Laurel Hill, one of only two prehistoric mounds in the meadowlands. The turnpike offers views of Manhattan above the fragmites of the swamp. On the left, the headquarters for the Meadowlands District Commission is visible from the turnpike. These are the lords of the Meadowlands. On the right, the twin towers of the Hack and Sack, uh, the Harmon Cove apartments in Secaucus. The turnpike flies over the mouth of Berry's Creek, a main drain for the Meadowlands. It passes the Crown Plaza in Secaucus, whose top floors offer some of the best views. The mega structures of the sports complex whiz by from the pike. The epic Xanadu, the largest and emptiest entertainment complex in the world. <laughs> and another toll plaza takes its toll. On the right of the plaza, the gas tank, familiar landmarks and monuments. On the left, the extensive swamp restoration work at the Kane Mitigation Bank. Then planes can be seen descending into Teterboro Airport at the northwest limit of the Meadowlands. The Bergen County Sewage Plant at the end of the plumbed liquid road for much of the region. The turnpike flies over the Hackensack near the community of Ridgefield, marking the northeast side of the Meadowlands, and approaches the service area, the last one on the turnpike. This is the turnaround point for the track and a good place to make a pit stop on the turnpike loop. Gas out, free brochures sometimes. <laughs> Lots of activities. It's definitely a place centered place. From the parking lot, to, then you can head south to the eastern spur and continue going around and around. The next service area to the south is named after Alexander Hamilton, one of America's founding fathers who was shot in a duel that took place over the hill in Weehawken. But for now, instead of going around and around, we'll take the first exit northbound after Vince Lombardi service area onto Route 46 westbound, which drops onto the surface streets in the northern mainlands. They call this zone one, the headwaters. Up here. Off the interstate, Highway 46 westbound becomes Sylvan Avenue, Little Ferry, a classic New Jersey car strip. You're driving, of course, on Sheldon Swamp. Highway 46 leads to Teterboro Airport, the northwest corner of the Meadowlands. The Meadowlands are anchored by these two airports, Teterboro and New York. We work at the bottom, Teterboro at the top. Airports are among the first things to get built on the swamps, it seems. Teterboro is one of the busiest small jet airports in the nation, serving corporate jet activity for New York City and northern New Jersey. Sony Aviation, for example, has a hangar and aircraft fleet for celebrities and VIPs, and limos waiting to take them into New York City. Dassault Falcon, the French business jet company, has its main business office for the Americas there. And then a dead end past the control tower is a regional aviation museum, which has a number of interesting avian specimens, like fragments of the Hindenburg, which burned in New Jersey's Lakehurst Navy base in 1937, ending the use of blimps as passenger vessels. It has an unusual array of aircraft, such as the Glidemobile, an early hovercraft test flown on a pond in New Jersey in 1959. Flight simulator used to train pilots at the dawn of the jet age. And extensive displays about Newark International, the other larger airport to the south. Newark was the first major airport built in the New York City area. In 1935, Amelia Earhart was on hand for the opening of the nation's first commercial airline terminal there. It was the busiest airport in the world at the time. In the 1970s, it was expanded into its current form with circular terminal hubs. It now handles 33 million passengers a year, more than LaGuardia, but less than JFK. 
United Flight 93 took off from here on September 11, 2001, crashing into a field in Pennsylvania two hours later. The Bendix Corporation had a major plant at Tiboro Airport for over 50 years, manufacturing flight control systems for military aircraft. And it was bought by Honeywell in 1983. The plant was closed in 2008, and the work was moved to a plant in Albuquerque. The property is being remediated by its new owners, the Catellus Development Company, once part of Santa Fe Railroad. All that's left of the legacy of Bendix is the Bendix Diner across from the airport in the corner of Highway 17. Heading south on Highway 17 from the diner, you are on the road that defines the western edge of the middle. It's residential hills on one side and industrial flats on the other. The old corridor still has vestiges of character from earlier times, like the Fiesta, full of colored fountains and a favorite prom, party, and wedding banquet location since the 1960s. Though it's filling in with contemporary national chain retail and restaurants, part of the great bed, bath, and beyond in New Jersey summer. <laughs> the Federal Reserve Bank of New York has its remote facility from Manhattan there. It's East Rutherford Operations Center, the main electronic processing center for the business busiest district of the Federal Reserve, originally built in 1992 to process all the checks used in transactions in New York City and Northern New Jersey. Now that nobody writes checks for all you know what they are doing there. Uh, nearby, Berry's Creek, it's a drainage artery, artery for the northern meadowlands and it flows out of its headwaters, which are essentially the areas between the runways of Teterboro Airport. And it goes into an industrial area south of Naki Avenue into a chemical processing site in the industrial areas uh, just south of the airport where hundreds of tons of mercury contaminated waste uh, went into the ground and into the creek over the years. The site, primarily called Ventron, is owned by Morton International now and has been somewhat remediated. It's the same company that built the space shuttle boosters and sells consumer salt. It's one of dozens of contaminated industrial sites laying fallow in the Meadowlands, stuck in the quagmire litigation. Nearby, the Universal Oil Product Superfund site consists mostly of fenced mounds next to a new Fairfield Inn. It was the site of a chemical plant that over the years dumped millions of gallons of waste solvents into online ponds, which then leached into the underlying swamp. The site on the Superfund list since 1983 is still being addressed. Many other interesting businesses are located in the industrial area between Teterboro, East Rutherford, and Menarchy Line, filled in meadowlands drained by various Creek. I don't know if you can read that. It's kind of funny. It says we need a bolt and screw. Uh, the world's headquarters for the Pantone Company, also in this office park. This is the company that manages the color standards for the graphics printing and other color critical industries worldwide. So this in a way is ground zero for color. <laughs> and petunias, perhaps. Uh, Macy's department store built a facility uh, in that same office park for their Thanksgiving Day Parade floats. The floats have been stored and serviced in the Meadowlands for decades, lower referenced in Woody Allen's film Broadway, Danny Rose, and they get kind of tangled up in the floats in New Jersey. This is a new, a new dedicated facility for the floats. It's kind of like a hangar, I guess. Um, nearby, the now vacated Safer Textiles Company uh, on State Street in Menachee, is undergoing an interesting groundwater and soil remediation process. Electrical sensors and tubes emerge from the network of wells, monitoring quantities and migrations of particular materials of interest. It's like an electrified ground. The process is ongoing. There's so many of these kinds of transitional places in the region, often orphaned and without personnel on site. 
suspended in a bureaucratic and litigious limbo. Some of these former industrial sites become a new kind of public space, a post-industrial funhouse for marginal and illicit activities of both creative and destructive nature. This is Hell, Hell's Gate uh, in the ferry. They become part of the community in ways that cannot be designed. <laughs> Another form of recreational space, model aircraft fields are a common thing to find on the margins of marginal lands. One such field is at the edge of the Munaki Industrial Park where the paved over swamp relents back to the Hackensack River and the Hackensack Valley Flyers sometimes meet up, though due to disagreements between other flying clubs displaced by Meadowlands remediation projects, the uh, field sort of comes and goes, and apparently I guess it's gone now. The field is at the gates of the Bergen County Utilities Authority's water treatment plant. One of the larger wastewater plants discharging into the Meadowlands, when it's overloaded, it sometimes ships sewage by barge to Newark. South of the plant is the north construction entrance for the Kane Mitigation Bank, a major marsh restoration project. The 240-acre site is owned by the Midlands Conservation Trust and is being turned back into a estuary. This is done by erasing the linear canals built over 100 years ago to drain the marsh, replacing them with a network of small meandering channels that allow tidal water from the Hackensack to penetrate the marsh. A major part of marsh restoration involves clearing out the invasive non-indigenous Phragmites, the plants that overtook the meadowlands uh, when the water became a little more brackish, uh, killing native vegetation and clogging up flow. The project is being financed as a mitigation bank, as they call it, the regional transit authorities and other developers that build projects in the swamps have to pay for restoration efforts here. That's why it's a mitigation bank. The bank is part of what was formerly known as the Empire Tract. Over 500 acres left undeveloped as part of an exchange that allowed the Xanadu Entertainment Complex to be started nearby. Fundamentally, it's a massive engineering project, the largest one going on in the Meadowlands, to create a landscape that functions as much as, as is possible like we were never there. Onto zone two, the recreation scape. That's this area, sports. Uh, this is a view of Berry's Creek and Walden Swamp is the part of the Meadowlands depicted there behind an office park in East Rutherford. It's bucolic like many of the vistas across the swamps, though the greenery is entirely invasive fragmented plants and the mercury in this area is the highest in the nation. On the other side of Walden Swamp is the Meadowlands Arena and Sports Complex, what most people think of when they think of the Meadowlands. The Sports Complex was an early development project by the Hackensack Meadowlands Development Commission. It is a cluster of half a dozen megastructures surrounded by parking lots. The complex is dominated by the new Meadowlands Stadium, the MetLife Insurance Company, bought the name and rights for it, so now it's called the MetLife Stadium. It's home field for the New York Giants and New York Jets, who sometimes play each other here, an unusual rivalry on shared home turf. I'm not quite sure how that works, but it cost $1.6 billion for this new complex, which was built basically next to the old complex, uh, which was 33 years old, but uh, was apparently out of date and was demolished after Bruce Springsteen concert in 2009. <laughs> Intentionally. Uh, the new stadium is built uh, next to the old stadium, which you can see in this Google Earth image, the old stadium site being demolished at the same time as the new one's being built. The debris from the old stadium filled in its own hole and you know, it's all covered over by a parking. Next to the Meadowlands Stadium is the Meadowlands Racetrack, a horse track built around the same time of the first stadium. 
like the people at the track, the track itself has been losing money for years. It's <laughs> considered <laughs> casinos, NASCAR, and other names and so forth. The interesting thing about the racetrack is that the lake in the middle of it is in the same shape, roughly, as the state of New Jersey. <laughs> Another big shed there is a sports complex uh, for known as the Timex Performance Center, which is the practice facility for the New York Giants. They have uh, three and a half football fields outside and one covered one in the shed. The water park, once used for boat races and water skiing events, is hardly used at all. The Izod Center holds around 20,000 people, built in 1981, originally is a basketball stadium and a hockey rink for professional teams, all of which have moved on to play elsewhere. The arena is used for rock concerts sometimes, also called the Continental Airlines Arena, I guess, recently, before the pro sports teams moved away. The clothing company Izod right, incidentally pays around a million dollars a year for the naming rights, but their contract is about to expire. We'll see what they call it next. Next to Izod, the latest and largest Metal Lens attraction has been under construction for almost a decade. This is Xanadu. It was to be the largest entertainment, sports, and retail complex in the country. The ground was broken in 2004. In 2009, with about 80% of the original structure, as it was conceived, uh, built and about $2 billion spent, financing fell apart, construction was halted. The unfinished complex is topped by what was to have been the nation's only indoor ski slope. Other features would include a 26 screen movie theater, bumper cars, laser tag, a giant Best Buy, Cabela's, Virgin Megastores, 300 foot tall Pepsi blazing Ferris wheel next to the turnpike. For two years, the two and a half million square foot building was quiet. Scorned as one of the nation's largest retail failures and called the ugliest building in America by the governor of New Jersey. <laughs> but the project was, as they say, too big to fail, and a new team and concept got to work on it. Uh, by the same group, that uh, built the Mall of America in Minneapolis, the largest mall in the USA, and the Edmonton Mall, also built by the same company that Netherlands at the uh, now. Uh, the mall, Edmonton Mall is the largest mall in North America. Uh, so the new plan announced uh, about a year ago would make this the, lar the largest mall in the world, and one bigger in China, uh, with seven and a half million square feet of retail space. The new name, American Dream Meadowlands. Yeah. <laughs> the empty turnpike on ramps that the state may present to may open yet. As you pass Xanadu on Patterson Plank Road, you go over the turnpike on a bridge uh, to an interesting area of relics on the Hackensack River, another kind of uh, recreation area from an older era, perhaps. The road's name comes, of course, from the fact Patterson Plank Road that it once connected Patterson, New Jersey to Jersey City, an early diagonal thoroughfare, partially made of wooden planks laid out on the swamp. On the other side of the bridge, you first come across the pipeline metering facilities for a three-foot diameter high-pressure gas line that runs through the Meadowlands, one of the big uh, linear elements bringing natural gas from the Gulf of Mexico to the Northeast. The gas tank landmarks uh, on the New Jersey Turnpike are accessed from here and are part of this system. But the Patterson Plank Road continues past the compressor station to this old marina area on the river. The old Patterson Plank Road roadbed, you can sort of see going through the diagonally from the top to the middle of this image. Uh, still persists uh, up to the water's edge. It follows the electric lines across an abandoned driving range to the base of the bridge no longer there, next to an abandoned marina. The bridge was connected to Secaucus on the other side of the river, but was torn down after Route 3 was built in the 30s. The driving range there was abandoned after a storm a few years ago. 
building owners that are using it as a paintball park, another activity that seems to creep into the margins and in between spaces, paintball. It's next to the Dragonfly Bar and Grill, the only active business left here in this old marina area where two small private boat clubs, the Majestic and the Snipe Club, still occupy the site. And the old home of the Steiner family, the family that owned the property in the 1970s, is still there, rotting and falling down in the midst of it all. The place is definitely on its way out on one hand. It's a rare old remnant of the old Hackensack River Rats. But it's becoming a park uh, and marina operated by the Meadowlands District Commission. This is now River Barge Park where the Meadowlands Commission keeps their fleet of uh, tour boats for taking people on deco tours into the Meadowlands under the shadow of the great pleasure dome <laughs> to be out in the American dream. You, know, as you can see the Steiner house there on the right dropping into the swamp. Zone three is it's called West Side Dumps, Graves, Communication, Interpretation, all that good stuff. It's over here next to the sports complex. Route 3 is the principal east-west highway coming across the Meadowlands, connecting Secaucus and, and Rutherford. At the west side of the sports complex, Route 3 passes over Berries Creek at the point that the natural drainage channel, Berries Creek through the swamp, meets the canal dug by the Erie Railway Company 100 years ago, where they converge. You can sort of see that confluence there. The canal helped industries to develop upstream that would later glue the creek to the point that fish can't even survive in it. Near the intersection of Route 3 and Route 17, the road that travels along the base uh, on the western side of the Meadowlands is the Meadowlands Museum, which is a nice little history museum about the Meadowlands. And it's located inside one of the area's oldest homes it's a you know, the local history museum for the region. Upstairs, the walls have been painted with displays about local minerals, natural history, and the more distant past. Coincidentally, this house was once the home of Charles Smithson, an ornamental concrete sculptor and plasterer who worked on the subway stations in New York City, and who was the grandfather of Robert Smithson. Robert Smithson was the pioneering conceptualist land artist who grew up nearby and who wrote the essay tours of the Man monuments of the Passaic and made Spiral Jetty in the Great Salt Lake. He's buried in the Hillside Cemetery across Route 3 from the Meadowlands <coughs> Museum. His grave overlooks the Meadowlands. Also overlooks the medieval times, a themed entertainment and dining establishment. Um, the base of the cemetery, and an anachronism in a warehouse. <laughs> One of several interesting businesses in the Meadowlands Corporate Center, an office park at the base of the hills. The Sitka Corporation nearby, a Swiss chemical conglomerate, uh, makes plastic sealants there on Polito Avenue next to Medieval Times. Across from them is the antenna field for WINS and the AM talk radio station, one of more than a dozen radio transmission tower sites in the Meadowlands. Radio stations use the undeveloped marshy areas as it's otherwise economically unproductive land and because it's open so radio waves don't hit anything, they can radiate unobstructed in the direction of their main audience, which I guess is us. It's radio ground waves uh, propagate. Uh, they actually uh, propagate very well over brackish water. Uh, so that's another benefit to being out in the Meadowlands. The Meadowlands are really the origin for all of the talk radio uh, for New York City. Past the warehouses uh, along Valley Brook Avenue in Rutherford, the Northern Gateway to the land of landfills, an area of terrestrial transformation, and remediation on a large scale. 
for over 100 years, dumping took place all over the Middle Lands in part to fill them in so they could be built on, but also as the expansive urban area around it needed a place to put its waste. The Hackensack Middle Lands Development Commission was established in 1969 to control the filling of the swamps and to deal with the unsanctioned landfills, some of which were visibly smoldering along the New Jersey Turnpike. Those were the days. Now called the New Jersey Meadowlands Commission, it is a regulatory agency that controls environmental projects, landfill closure, redevelopment over their 30.4 or so square miles, most of the partially or minimally filled in uh, swamp parts of the Meadowlands and all of its landfills. The area along Valley Brook Avenue much of which is former dumps, has been slated for redevelopment on a large scale. The NCAP development proposal, which involved a golf course, hotel, townhouses, retail, was to cover uh, about 800 acres of the area. But after $300 million spent in planning and site work, the project went bankrupt a few years ago. Controversial thing. The headwater headquarters of the Middle East Commission is down this road past the NCAP site at the end of Valley Brook Avenue where the street name changes to Disposal Road. <laughs> the main building has administrative offices for the commission as well as some displays and a gift shop. The former and notable garbage museum which was on display through the early 1990s has been replaced by an educational center for teaching school kids about natural science and biology. A promontory extending from the building out over the marsh enables visitors to feel more immersed in the marsh. At the end of the walkway is the Marsh View Pavilion, surrounded by canted plaques providing perspectives and interpretive captions for the views around the area, mostly landfills. The Commission headquarters, in fact, is located on the Kingsland Impoundment, a 90-acre burned enclosure in the swamp filled mostly with open water. The impoundment was supposed to become a landfill in the 1970s, but was instead purchased to be the agency's headquarters in a natural preserve, signaling the turnaround of the metal lands controlled by the Commission at that point. It's now part of Richard DeCourt Park, which has a number of trails and viewing areas around the impoundment. Viewing tubes and interpretive plaques, angled perspectives. This one, nice view of the turnpike. The Marsh Discovery Trail, the uh, Transco Trail, uh, indicated on the map here, is a mile long walkway on a burn covering that same three foot diameter <coughs> gas pipe. And the trail is actually on the pipe itself. The landscape there, though, is really largely for the birds, who in turn provide their own interpretive layer. <laughs> <laughs> The Amvets Carillion is a memorial to veteran made in 2007. Bells chime daily, one of a few memorials in the park around the Bells Commission headquarters. The September 11 memorial faces the distant view of the Manhattan skyline and it has a twin tower like kind of pier thing that appears you can't go on. Next to the piers is an overlook where you can stand and line up with a steel silhouette of a skyline which has the Twin Towers on it, while the actual skyline, of course, does not. The Meadowlands Commission office is located also at the base of the Kingsland landfill. The uh, County Utility Authority operated the site as a municipal landfill for the region for decades. It was being remediated as part of the NCAP project. It was supposed to be part of the golf course. There aren't a whole lot of things you can build on top of the landfill because the ground subsides and changes, but golf courses are often solutions. But all of that, of course, didn't happen. This Disposal Road continues south from the base of the Kingsland landfill, past landfill gas collection points, where the methane from the landfill is burned to produce electricity. 
the road leads to an abandoned Baylor facility, once operated by the county as the at the entrance to the Kingsland and Erie landfills. The Meadowlands Commission was a pioneer in a number of aspects of landfill management, including techniques for compressing incoming garbage so that it would be more easily transported and so it wouldn't take up less space in the landfill. So these were big trash compactors uh, where cubes of trash would be formed roughly a cubic yard in size weighing somewhere around 3,000 pounds each. These were the bales, which would then be trucked and stacked in the landfill with front loaders, kind of like a warehousing system for waste, a permanent one. Um, the system was abandoned when the landfills were shut down. These are the scales for weighing incoming trucks baler facility where the buildings themselves have become trash. Uh, except for the original solid waste baling facility nearby, which once housed the largest waste baling machines in the nation. It's still being used to handle trash, but in the usual kind of uh, dump and load system, baling doesn't go on anymore. The sawmill lane fell next to the baler, known in commission terminology as landfill 1E, and locally as Mount Arlington, is one of the largest landfills in the Midlands. It's a consolidation of landfill 1C and uh, North Arlington's bale fill landfill, several hundred acres in size. It's one of the tallest hills. It has a panoramic view of the landscape north, south, and east across the sawmill marsh, and then the turnpike, and then Jersey City, Caucus, and Manhattan. Zone 4, uh, simply Carney, speaks for itself, uh, sort of. It's the town at the bottom of the Meadowlands. <coughs> oh, there we go. So most of his population lives on that side, 40,000 people. Uh, then there's an equally large industrial peninsula of South Kearney at the confluence of the Hackensack and uh, the Sand River. And then there's a kind of a chaotic labyrinth zone in the middle of Carney, where the terminal eddies uh, and swamps are legion. The eastern flank is landfill 1E, just inside the town line of Carney. Below that landfill is the Belleville Turnpike, an old two-lane surface road that runs diagonally across the southern Meadowlands. It was paved in 1914, but dates all the way back to the late 1700s when it was used to carry copper from the Shiler Mines, one of the uh, nation's earliest copper sources located in what is now the residential part of North Arlington on the edge of Kearney. The long since closed and built over, the old underground mining complex is full of caverns and shafts just below the surface. In 1989, some of these cavities collapsed into sinkholes, damaging the Shiler condominiums on Shiler Avenue. The General Industrial Park is a special <coughs> area on the Belleville Turnpike across from Landfill 1E with its share of brown fields, also prone to flooding. South of the industrial park is the Carney Marsh, a freshwater marsh that is contained within 310 acre impoundments. You can see all the lines of roads and pipelines and rails that lock in these kind of ponds. The Keegan landfill, one of the few active landfills left in the Midlands, leaks leachate into the water and into the already high levels of contaminants in the landlocked marsh. South of Kearney Marsh is the southwest corner of the Meadowlands on the north side of Passaic, uh, the Passaic River, with uh, landfill 1D and 
landfill 15W, which is named after Turnpike Exit, next to it. Here at Cloverleaves, Walmart, Postal Processing Centers, Scrap Yards, uh, tend to sort of fill in the triangular voids between things. It says New York, Jersey City Turnpike. Uh, this is the point, no point swing bridge which crosses the Passaic in a bend called Harrison Reach. The reach is often cited as the most contaminated stretch of river in the nation. Industries along the banks include the former diamond alkali plant, which made DDT in the 1950s and Agent Orange in the 1970s. Owned now by Occidental Chemical of Los Angeles, some of the wastes at the facility have been covered over by a berm, otherwise known as the Diamond Alkali Superfund site. The view from there across the Harrison Reach uh, from underneath the turnpike actually takes in the New Jersey uh, transit tracks. If you ever go to New York Airport, you run right along there, running along the base of landfill 1D. The incidental impoundment ponds are especially heavy around here, formed by the random crisscrossing of trajectories and pipelines, rail lines, roadways, landfills, on ramps, and berms. Each pond is its own anonymous ecotonic soup. The Belleville Turnpike continues its cross section of it all, observing and adding to the chaos in its way. Passing radio transmitters, blasting more scratchy AM hysteria visibly through and over the land. To the relative tranquility of landfill 1A. 1A was the first commissioned landfill to be closed in a modern way using technologies they devised, which are now commonplace, such as digging a deep channel around the base of the landfill to isolate it from surrounding groundwater and pumping the collected leachate out through a series of wells, sending it by pipeline to local sewage treatment plants. The leachate from this mound is the color of strong tea. Other innovations at this landfill include building a pond on top of it, a pond which has since collapsed as the landfill has settled considerably over the past 30 years. The commission worked with uh, the artist Nancy Holt to turn the landfill into a sculpture and celestial observatory called Sky Mound. She spent decades on the project, though only a few of her ideas were implemented. It's unknown if the public would ever have been able to even visit Sky Mound and taken in its views directly, or if they would just have to enjoy what they could see of it such as the planned methane flares uh, from the turnpike as they drove by. Landfill 1A is now covered in solar panels uh, as of a year ago. Another use for landfills, I suppose. Uh, across the Belleville Pike from Landfill 1A is a road that heads out to a network of linear burns and interesting landmarks and overlooks. Along the way, the crusty shoreline of the pond behind the Royal Linens, the towers of WNCA, Christian Talk Radio. The main road ends where the Portal Rail Bridge for active New Jersey transit and Amtrak lines that cross the Hackensack next to Laurel Hill. North, the road continues on an undulating paved berm along the water's edge and leads to an underlook, I guess we call it, uh, of the New Jersey Turnpike and onward to the swing bridge for Conrail, taken out of service in 2003. On the other side of that bridge is Laurel Hill Park in Secaucus, one of the few public boat ramps providing water access to the Meadowlands. In, in the other direction, there's an underpass, the Northern Gateway, to one of the largest and most complex contaminated brownfields in the Meadowlands. The property generally referred to as Copper's Coke, uh, as much of it was a coke plant operated by the Coppers Company. From uh, 1917 to 1979, most of the buildings, including the coal tar processing plant and the storage facilities, have been removed and the landscape is being cleaned up. 
the northern part is the former Diamond Shamrock Chromate Chemical Plant, a 30-acre industrial site that operated from 1916 to 1976, owned by Tierra Solutions, a corporate entity derived from its successors, Diamond Shamrock and Occidental Chemical, the same folks that have the alkali site down there. The Pacific River, as mentioned before. Uh, another part of the property located in the middle operates, operated until much more recently, uh, and it has several buildings that are still standing left over from when it was the standard chlorine site operating until 1993. Producing chemicals such as drain cleaning products, mothballs, um, contaminants on the site include hexavalent chromium, dioxin, chlorobenzene, and naphthalene. Was on Superfund site starting in 2003, and uh, the pools of water are an unusual color. The former distillation tower is a landmark on the Hackensack, not apparently an aid to navigation. <laughs> the Copper's Coke site uh, and its other adjacent facilities, it's one of the largest potentially redevelopable heavy industry sites in the region, and many interests are at work planning its future. It has access problems, it spills directly into fast moving traffic on Belleville Turnpike, but they're working on that. This is the east end of the site where earth moving has been going on for years, using a barge loading facility you can see in the image on the right, uh, that moves the soil from the location and brings clean soil to it. A lot of the earth moving work uh, has been done by the Stevenson Company, can we pronounce Stevenson, I don't know, an environmental services company, the same one that uh, uh, worked at Love Canal in Niagara Falls and uh, operates at over 100 Superfund sites across the country. Uh, the company is still based in uh, Niagara Falls, New York. Where Love Canal is located. Also working there is the Clean Earth Company, uh, which handles uh, hazardous soil. Next to it is uh, a roofing plant run by uh, Corning Owens Corning, which uh, still does uh, uses the same materials that were busy on the site uh, to make shingles. Uh, the, coke and tar industries. This is the last run of it uh, at that location. The Copper's Coke site is at the northeast corner of the peninsula of South Carney, which is a kind of industrialized fulcrum between Jersey City and Newark. Long ago, we paved over marshland and at the confluence of the Hackensack on, on the right, the Sav on the left. The peninsula is separated from the more open lanes of the Meadowlands to the north by the rail yards that span from one river to the other, centered around the, the uh, maintenance center for New Jersey Transit. Also, the rail company CSX operates an uh, intermodal yard there, a kind of transition between truck and rail and container. Uh, the, Big power plant uh, landmark there, the Carney Generating Station looms over the Hackensack. Thomas Edison was actually on hand when it opened in 1925, and since then it's been updated several times. Uh, four units currently burning natural gas, about 500 megawatts. The Pulaski Skyway soars over it, and soars over. I mean, all of South Carney, over the Skyway Diner, once a favorite stop for truckers, uh, also a favorite stop for fans of the Sopranos, uh, get there from Times Square. Uh, it was an icon of Italian-American mob kind of place, and so it was used as a location for at least one shooting scene, shooting scene. Um, the Skyway has one exit along its three and a half mile path, a narrow ramp that drops straight into South Carney. 
trucking dominates South County like nowhere else on the planet, really. Everything here serves the truck. That's called truck stop diner. That was 18 wheeler bars that says garbage haulers hiring. Uh, the Highway 1 and 9 truck route built in the 1950s actually to take truck traffic off of the Pulaski Skyway, which was you know, built at great expense, was not a good place for trucks to be narrow. Um, so the, and it was structurally limited, so they built this new truck route which goes across South Carney, and, uh, and that helped turn that area into one of the great truck logistics sites on, on the planet. All of it's a foreign trade zone, or much of it is. Even the old uh, Western Electric plant that was uh, for many years, from 1926 to 1986, was Bell Telephone's primary operating you know, factory for building electronic components, employed thousands of people. It's now just a lease space for trucking and storage. Um, the, an old landing site uh, on the Passaic side is a resin plant, uh, a contaminated industrial site waiting for treatment. It's where Clean Earth, the company working locally, has one of its uh, staging yards. The largest site on the South Carney Peninsula is the former federal shipyards. Back in uh, 1917, World War I, this was a major shipyard. Um, it was uh, built destroyers and other ships. In World War II, it became uh, even bigger. 32,000 people worked there. And then in the 70s, it became a ship breaking facility where they took maybe even some of the same ships apart, uh, taking them down for scrap, including aircraft carriers and things. And now it's all the shipways, for the most part, are paved in a uh, warehouse. The site is uh, no longer really connected to the water. It's just a, a trucking and storage facility with over 500 million square feet. Uh, space inside. The north end of the site has been developed into a correctional complex for the county and the state. Trains of waste are often parked in the middle of the South County Peninsula between the Western Electric Factory and the shipyard awaiting disposal. The southern tip of the peninsula is divided in half quite clearly. One half has a waste treatment plant with some intermodal rail yards. And the other side on the Passaic is a former industrial site being remediated. And the southern tip extends into Newark Bay. The last zone is Caucus. Jewel of the Metal Mines. Official town <coughs> Situated between the base of the hills to the east and the Hackensack River to the west, Secaucus is both the jewel and the heart, in a way, of the Meadowlands. The community is surrounded completely by the Meadowlands itself and the swamp. It is therefore in and of the swamp, whether it looks like swamp anymore or not. The north part of the community is around 1,700 or 17,000 sort of residents living in a fairly tight residential area. The southern area is an office park. There's the sign, Jewel the Meadowlands. Their logo is also telling there you've got the housing industry, New York and distance in these kind of lines. Centrally located, but isolated. Getting to Secaucus is both easy and hard. From Kearney, the, in, in most places, overland access is from the south through one of the most concentrated conveyance bottlenecks in the area. Numerous rail lines and roadways converge at the base of the hills. There's a southern tip of Secaucus, entering tunnels and road cuts heading towards tunnels under the Hudson. It's as if nearly all the linear elements of the southern Meadowlands emanate or converge from this place. And it's under construction, being completely rejiggered, 
at a cost of hundreds of millions. If you can find your way out of the mess, off Highway 19, go Northland County Road, the Southern Gateway, and just caucus between the Carson Rail Yard and yet another large postal service facility. This one, this postal service facility, handles most of the bulk mail for New York City. So this is where your junk mail comes from. The county road crosses the town line into Secaucus, unmarked, uh, but near an old brick farmhouse. Secaucus was famous for its big farms. In the old days, much of the food waste from New York City, restaurants and grocery stores would find its way to farms over here on the edge of the swamps and consumed by pigs. Due to the proximity of industries in the area, even this old farmstead hemmed in his soil contamination issues running down from Benoit Creek. Across the tracks from the farmstead is the Grand, relatively new Secaucus Junction Rail Station, the key in the effort to create a transportation hub in Secaucus. The temple of transportation, really. The station is still considerably larger than its usage demands. It opened in 2003 at a cost of over half a billion dollars. It was built over the crossing of two lines and allows people to transfer from one to the other and a direct connection resulting to Penn Station, New York City, one stop away. In 2005, the exit off the turnpike called 15X uh, opened in front of the station, connecting it to the interstate road network as well. The exit ramp passes by the station building that heads out over the interstitial zones of the rail yards on a two mile long loop in order to be able to site the toll booth. Uh, then go the back again. Despite this asset, it's the least used exit on the turn bike. Part of this new hub notion was the construction of a large residential community across from the station in the exit 15X called Exchange at Secaucus Junction. It started in 2006 with the grading and filling of the land next to the Hensack River. After a number of delays, the project uh, is now completed in its first and second phases at least, uh, and other phases are imminent. The exchange apartments are next to Laurel Hill Park, a county park established at the base of the largest natural hill in the Meadowlands. Though it's not quite natural anymore, of course, as most of the hill was removed over decades uh, of use as a quarry. Laura Hill Park has one of the few boat ramps I mentioned. Uh, it's thus a major portal for aquatic forays into the Meadowlands across from uh, Sawmill Marsh. You can rent canoes there. Other amenities in the park include sporting grounds for sanctioned activities, at least. Parking for sanctioned cars. The area around the hill has a complicated past. The site has been a church, a poor farm, an insane asylum, a prison, and is now a dinosaur park attraction as of this summer. Um, on the other side of the hill is the River Bend Marsh and the old overgrown Malanka landfill, named after its owner, Tony Malanka. The mounds have sunk to less than 70 feet high. Continue north into Secaucus on Seaview Drive and you enter into the Harmon Cove area. Uh, most of this region was developed by the Hearts Mountain Company, uh, still privately held. Uh, it's uh, really single handedly responsible for developing much of Secaucus. They started out uh, uh, as a pet food company, bird food primarily, diversified, obviously. Uh, and uh, started out here in 1969, building uh, the, the commercial park, the Harmon Cove, and the Harmon Meadows residential area as well. 
This is uh, Macy's main logistics center. The office park owned by Hearts Mountain is uh, mostly clothing warehouses. Data centers are springing up around the area too. This is the Equinix New York 4 data center. Data centers obviously require lots of space and cooling and are increasingly being found in kind of marginal areas outside cities. This one's next to Burlington Coat Factory Warehouse and a Gucci outlet. Uh, Seaview Drive turns north after Macy's and the Equinix Center turning at the big twin towers that are uh, the Harmon Cove condominium complex visible all over the Meadowlands. This was the first major shoreline development negotiated by the Hackensack Commission in the 1970s. Next to the towers is a wrangling condo development on the river, which is really hard to see from the road, but occupies a considerable amount of frontage on the river. BHX Drawbridge is across from the condos and spans the river, providing an industrial pastoral vista, I guess, and the drawbridge it's an alley of the bascule type, um, lifting a counterbalance span. It was built in 1911, but interestingly designed by Joseph Strauss, who also you know, was the chief engineer of uh, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And uh, Strauss was also a poet, actually wrote lovingly about redwood and square trees. Panasonic. Uh, Developed its headquarters there in the Harmony Cove Park, building the largest warehouse building in 1973, and the major first anchor tenants really. But in 2010, they announced they were moving to New York. The Meadowlands Hospital, located nearby with views over the alien Hackensack River. North of the condos is the Crown Plaza, offering the best views of the Meadowlands, available on a daily basis. Uh, but the Red Roof Inn nearby, of a lower elevation, uh, provides views at half the cost. The Red Roof also has parking for boats on the Hackensack. This is where the Hackensack Riverkeeper keeps his boat. Uh, Bill Sheehan, a very active member of the uh, uh, interest groups trying to clean up the region. The Red Roof Inn is also in between the eastbound and westbound lanes of Route 3, which go across the river there to the sports center. And just up the road is the cable landing site at the other end of what we saw before as Patterson Plank Road on the sports complex side when the bridge would have landed here at Charlie Park and Secaucus continued on its way at the bridge. It's now gone. There's the view from Charles Park looking out towards the American Dream. Mill Creek Point Park was recently built by the Midlands Commission and provides access directly into the swamp at Mill Creek. You can take a canoe right up to the uh, almost to the headquarters of the Harmon Cove Company. Um, due to mitigation regulations that required the destruction of the marsh for the Harmon Meadows commercial park, uh, this was preserved as marsh. That's often how it works out there. It's sort of a trade-off for development to get preservation. Recreational crabbers tie up to the sheet piling. Although downstream in New York Bay, the crabs are considered so toxic that it would be dangerous to eat more than one every 20 years. <laughs> Commercial fishing has been banned since the 1980s. A quarter mile long pedestrian bridge over the high school marsh, as it's called, has interpreted plaques and connects to the high school the park. Harmon Meadow is the other part of the, the Hearts Mountain development in Secaucus, surrounded by a landlocked uh, swamp land bisected by the turnpike at its intersection with Route 3. Businesses are mostly big box retail, and 
business hotels along West Side Road, which runs along East Edge and Meadowlands, or the North Burden, uh, Burden uh, Rail Yards and the Trash Sorting and Loading Facilities, the West Side Trans Load Company, which ships New York's trash to faraway states by rail. Up the tracks from them is Fruiteron, the point of origin for some of the mysterious smells that waft over Manhattan, causing alarm and concern. Apparently it's a kind of maple smell. Maybe you've smelled it. They dealt it. Also along the west side of the road, more clothing, warehouses, and another co-location data center, also in my Equinix. Behind it is uh, Liz Claiborne's distribution center, Chroma Kill Creek, um, which flows under the turnpike and into the Hackensack. And as you head south along the base of the ridge, the hills that form the eastern boundary of the Midlands, the landscape of logistics intensifies. Eastbound, Route 3 goes into a deep road cut that plunges into the Lincoln Tunnel that we hawking. New Jersey Transit Rail Line goes underground here too, stopping next to Penn Station. The portal site for the recently abandoned Arc Tunnel project is located there, proposed to relieve congestion and provide more public transportation to and from New York City, but the site is now vacant next to another portal. And then in the search for remains for the original Penn Station, the ornamental railroad terminal that was torn down in Manhattan in the 1960s and whose debris was dumped in the Meadowlands, attention has focused on one truck yard in particular on the edge of Sokolakis. Remains have been recovered here from the old terminal and in the swamps around the yard. Though in general, it's hard to say for sure what came from that building in particular, since the metal hands are filled in with material from everywhere. Dumped material dissolves and is pulled down into the groundwater, the boggy soup that underlies and defines the metal lands. The saturated ground leaks and moves flowing around and through the landfills and finds its way inevitably to the creeks, like Ben Horn Creek that flow through the truck yards and its caucus. The creek, though, persists, flowing behind the office parks and past the old big farms under County Road and the Croxton Rail Yards, past the caucus junction in the exit 15X toll booth, past the Monica landfill and into the Hackensack, York Bay, and out to sea. Back to the great bottleneck at the confluence effluence of Secaucus, New Jer Jersey City, Kearney, and the Hackensack. A scene dominated by the smokestacks and the big piles of coal of the Hudson Generating Station where Pinhorn Creek enters the river. The best choice for a way out is the Skyway, and pretty much the only choice. If you have a choice. Leaving Jersey City, the Skyway lifts off the ground and flies over the Hackensack and the South Kearney. Though it's only a few miles long, the Skyway is in a world of its own.